So, uh, the whole compound can be divided into three sections. The first section is outside called the courtyard in which only the Levites, the tribe of Levi, were allowed in. The second part, the second section is this room that we're all standing in. This is called the holy place. And in here, only the priests were allowed to come in here. The third part is the most important. It's the room over here in the back called the Holy of Holies. And in there, only the high priest was allowed to enter in there and only once a year. Which day of the year? Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, correct. In English, the Day of Atonement. The same day that he was to make the sin sacrifice that I was talking about. On one side of the tabernacle, if you look over there, you'll see a table of showbread. On the table were 12 loaves of bread. Why 12? 12 tribes. 12 tribes, correct. It symbolizes God's provision for the 12 tribes of Israel. But only the priests were allowed to eat from the bread, and they ate it on Shabbat, on Saturday. Later on, on Sunday, the first day of the week, they would make more bread, and it would sit here for a full week, fresh and tasty, until the next Shabbat. Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus many, many times says, I am, I am. And many of these I am's, he's referring to different items in the temple and the tabernacle. Like, for example, I am the gate, or I am the bread of life. Or when he says, I am the light of the world, he's referring to the menorah, mm -hmm. the golden lampstand, which you'll see if you look on that side. The golden lampstand, the menorah, was made of pure gold. And it was uh, also part of the eternal flame that they were not allowed to let burn out. To keep it from burning out, every day the priests had to fill the lamps with olive oil, and the fire would burn in the front with a little wick, with a little piece of string. And you can see that, uh, the little hole in the front there. It was the only source of light in the whole room. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, if all the walls were covered in gold, you can imagine all that light reflecting off the walls and lighting up the whole room. That represents Jesus as the light of the world. It represents his perfection and holiness and righteousness. But do you remember what I said in the beginning, that we are the tabernacle of God? So just as the walls of the tabernacle reflected the light of the menorah, we need to reflect the light of Jesus unto those around us because he is the source of light. Someone told us that the entrances were called the way, the truth, and the life. Is that true? Way, the truth, and the life. Isn't that right, the, David? The, the there might be the some connection. Told us, told I never thought about that. that. Uh, there might be some connection, but I never thought about that. I don't think they're explicitly called by those names, but I think I can see uh, how they would represent that. The outer gate, the way, for example, the the, uh, the tabernacle, the whole courtyard, was in the center of the camp with the 12 tribes camped all around, three on each side, three, 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 three. But what uh, what uh, tribe sat at the very entrance, at the very front there in the middle? Correct, the tribe of Judah. So in order to come in, you have to pass through the tribe of Judah. Jesus came from which tribe? Judah. 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 That shows Jesus is the only way. So I, I can see the connotation there. I can see the, uh, the, the connection. Jesus is the way. That's why you have to pass through the, through the tribe of Judah to come here in the first place. You have to recognize Jesus is the only way. Um, the way, the truth, and the life. Um, yeah. We've been told that several times. I, I'm going to look more into that. That's very, very fascinating. So, um, yeah. Over here next to me is the altar of innocence. Here... They did not sacrifice animals like they did outside. But here, every day, the priests had to offer up incense, which is a mixture of different materials, different plants and herbs and flowers and, and so on. They, they would grind into a very fine powder, and they would sprinkle that powder on the altar of incense, and, and it would fill the whole room with a beautiful smell, with a beautiful aroma. This represents prayer. It represents the prayers of the Israelites ascending to heaven, but it also represents our prayers today as being like a sweet and beautiful smell to the Lord. In Psalm 141, David says, let my prayers be like an incense before you. Mm -hmm. A 
regular priest was dressed only in white with a head covering. But the high priest had a far more beautiful uniform. You can see here all the different layers and pieces and colors that he had to wear. Um, you can see the 12 tribes of Israel on the breastplate and each tribe had its own precious stone to uh, represent it. On his shoulder, he had the 12 sons of Jacob written according to age that they were born. From oldest to youngest, from Reuben to Benjamin. Across his forehead, he had a crown of gold that said, Holiness to the Lord. Now, when we read in English, the Lord, usually in all caps, it's not actually translating from the Hebrew word, Lord Adonai, but it's referring to the personal name of God, spelt with the Hebrew letters, yud he vav he pronounced Yehovah, or Yahweh, or, or Jehovah, or however you would pronounce it. But the name of God, Yehovah, is short for Hayah which means was and is and will be. So that's something to remember, something to keep in mind. Whenever you read the Lord in English, just remember that that's what his name means. It refers to his eternal existence. On the bottom, he had these bells that would ring whenever he walked around. And whenever the Israelites heard the bells, then they knew that the high priest was nearby. He had a very, very, very important role. He was the mediator between God and Israel. He was the uh, the middleman, the representative, the ambassador. On Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, he was the only person in the whole compound. No one else was even allowed into the courtyard on that day. And on that day, um, first he had to offer a personal sacrifice for himself, and then make the sacrifice for all of Israel. And he would walk in with the blood of that sacrifice into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle that blood on the Ark of Covenant. And that atoned and covered the sins of Israel for the past year. It's very, very, very important to keep in mind, very important to remember that the Israelites did not make the sacrifice for themselves, but it was the high priest that had to make the sacrifice on behalf of Israel. So why do you think that is? Jesus is the only one who could make the sacrifice for us. And the reason for that is that there is nothing we can do in our own power to receive forgiveness of sin. It is only by the power and love and grace of God. That's why, uh, that's why God arranged it to be that way, that the high priest had to make it for, had to make the sacrifice for Israel. It, it's to show, to demonstrate, to point to the fact that, that we cannot, uh, that we cannot pay for our own sins. God is the one that provides that solution for us. God is the one that paid it for us. And of course, Jesus is our high priest. The book of Hebrews talks about this multiple times in Hebrews chapter 4, chapter 8, and chapter 9. It compares Jesus and the high priest to each other. So Jesus uh, is the one that paid the price for us. Mm-hmm. So uh, now I'll be talking about the Holy of Holies and the Ark of Covenant. Normally I would uh, let everyone in there and give the explanation, but we are a few too many people to be able to fit in there all at once. So when I'm done explaining, then you guys may enter in and then exit through the back door. So in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of Covenant. Inside the Ark were three things. What was inside the Ark? Ten Commandments. What was that? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, Ten commandments. yes. Manna and Aaron's rod. Very good. Each of these three items represent a different aspect of our relationship with God. The Ten Commandments represent the covenant between us and God. When we sin, we break that relationship with God. And every single sin can be categorized into at least one of the Ten Commandments, usually more more often than not, usually even more than one. Uh, So it represents very covenant between us and God. Uh, The jar of manna represents God's provision in our lives, just as he provided for the Israelites out in the desert. God provides all our needs today, both the physical and the spiritual. And the staff of Aaron, the rod of Aaron, Aaron was the first high priest. He was the brother of Moses. It was through the staff that blossomed with almond flowers that God showed the Israelites that he indeed had chosen Aaron to be the first high priest and that it wasn't just nepotism because he's Moses' brother or whatever. I spoke about how the high priest is the mediator, so the staff represents the mediator. 
but the staff also represents Jesus as the mediator, and that the blossoming of the flowers represent Jesus' resurrection from death. Hmm. So you have these three things that represent our relationship with God through uh, the covenant, the provision, and the mediator. And when the high priest came in with the blood of that sacrifice on Yom Kippur and sprinkled that blood on the ark, that represents God looking through the blood onto what connects us to him, showing that only through blood we can be in a relationship with God, and only through blood we can repair that relationship with God that has been broken by sin. Back then, the temporary solution was the blood of the sacrifice year after year after year, but it was only a temporary solution pointing to the ultimate solution, which is the blood of Jesus <clears throat> that covers us once and for all. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, oh, wait, wait a second. One yes. Second. Oh, oh, oh. I, I just want to say you did an outstanding job and, and I don't know if you're here for a period of time or you're here for uh, uh, you know six months at a time or a year down in the desert but God is using you and I can tell in wonderful ways because the people who come through with the things that you're saying it's fantastic that you're able to connect the dots for people so they see the real spiritual truth behind this place so thank you very much you did a great and outstanding job I just want to tack on a couple important things to kind of tie together the things that he said, which were fantastic. Um, and that is, in the Bible, God gave three divinely appointed positions. There were three divinely appointed positions. You know them. Prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, priest, and king. The prophet, think of it this way simply. The prophet was God's spokesperson or spokesman to the people. Thus saith the Lord, right? God's spokesperson to the people from up to down, the prophet, okay? The priest was the people's representative before a holy God from down to up, okay? So the priest was God's, were the people's representative before a holy God. That's why the priest would offer sacrifice on behalf of the nation, right? In the tabernacle. Okay? And the king was God's divinely appointed vice regent over the affairs of his people. So you had three divinely appointed offices. But do you know that in the Bible, no man held all three offices? No one held all three offices. Except Jesus Christ. Except Jesus Christ. You know, one person in the Old Testament who had two of those. There are some that came close. They're, they're, they're not the king who had two of them. Exactly. Exactly. King and priest, which and, even that was very and Moses' functionality was was kind of very close. It was a mixture. Yeah. But no one had all three, except for Jesus Christ. But I want to draw your attention. So Jesus is here. He's, he's, he's giving prophecy, right? From his Father in heaven, he's declaring to the people prophetic truth. On the Mount of Olives in Matthew chapter 24, the right. disciples say, what's the sign of your coming the end of the age? And Jesus is prophesying to them what will transpire in the days ahead and, and many other instances. But I want, you to, I want you to understand the significance of the concept of the high priest. Because Jesus, what would a, what would a high priest do? A high priest would, would, again, representing the people before God, would offer a sacrifice, an atonement for sin, on behalf of the nation to a holy God, which is a consuming fire. That's what the high priest would do. When Jesus came and he was on the cross of Calvary, do you know what he was doing? He was offering, he was offering an atonement on behalf of all of humanity, all who would come to faith. He was offering an atonement for sin, a sacrifice for sin, but do you know what? He turned around as our great high priest, and he himself turned around and was the sacrifice that was offered. He was the agent offering it, and he was the object. He was the sacrifice himself. And you know what we're told in the book of Hebrews, and you mentioned it, in Hebrews chapter 4. Listen to the kind of high priest that we have, because we have a high priest in heaven at the right hand of God the Father who is advocating for you right now, right now. He's, he's in heaven advocating on your behalf. When we sin, 
before a holy God who's a consuming fire? Jesus says, but Father, I shed my blood as a sacrifice and atonement for their sin. He is advocating for us right now in heaven on behalf of all of you. We don't even think about the actual work that Jesus Christ continues to do on our behalf as our great high priest. Mm -hmm. And listen to what Hebrews chapter 4 says. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. Where was Jesus tempted? Nearby. Nearby, right? Up at the north end of the Dead Sea. After he was baptized, he was taken in the wilderness for 40 years, tempted in three ways. 40 days. 40 days. 40 days. I'm catching what you have. <laughs> He's tempted and he passed the test wonderfully, perfectly. So listen, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's the kind of high priest that we have, our great high priest, who is advocating for us because he himself was the sacrifice that was offered on our behalf. What an amazing savior that we have. So this was a picture in the Old Testament of what the high priest's office would do. Now, I mentioned there were three offices. The last one, you have prophet, right? God's spokesperson to the people. The priest, the people's representative before a holy God, and king. When we see Jesus Christ return the second time as the warrior king, of king. king, he comes back as the king of kings and lord of lords to reclaim what rightfully belongs to him because he is from the lion of the tribe of the Judah. ones that were located Judah. right in front of the tabernacle that you had to pass through. Judah. Judah. Yep. So he has the, the right and the authority and the bloodline, the lineage to be King David's greater son, the covenant that God made with King David that your son will sit upon the throne of Israel forever. Right. Jesus Christ, when he comes back, king. Prophet, priest, priest. and king. Right. The only one holding all three offices. Okay. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Amen.